Well, good morning once again, church. Uh, we are pre-recording on Friday, September the 18th for Sunday, September the 20th. I am Pastor Daniel. We're here at Peterborough Free Methodist Church uh, for our online worship service once again. Thank you so much for joining in with us in this way. Uh, last Sunday, in fact, uh, at 11 o'clock, uh, we went out to the pavilion at Nichols Oval Park. Now, I was watching the weather all week because it was predicting rain. Well, sure enough, uh, this was one of those times where they were exactly correct. And at 10 o'clock in the morning at my house, I watched as the, the clouds opened up and the rains came down. And I thought, oh man, I don't know how many will be there at the pavilion, but I'll go and, and see who shows up. Well, wouldn't you know, 55 people braved the weather and they came out to the pavilion and to the park uh, to fellowship with one another. And, and I thought that was just such a tremendous blessing. Uh, we only have two more Sundays when we get to go to the park, folks. Uh, today, the 20th, and then uh, the 27th. Those are the two last times that we have to uh, do this. Uh, it's a covered pavilion so that if it does rain, the rain is off of our heads. There's lots of space there. So if you're nervous about connecting with other people and how close will I get, you know what? You can be as distanced from others as you want to be. Uh, but there is a blessing when we get to see one another. And just think about, we've been six months where you haven't seen many of the folks in your own church family. And this is one of those opportunities for us to be able to see one another, fellowship with one another, uh, talk with one another, greet one another, and uh, uh, just be reminded of, of who all is in our church family. And, and I know that we've been connecting in other ways and we've organized pods and, and there's all those other things too. But there's something about the church getting together in full. And when we come into the building, as you know already, we won't be able to be together in full. Uh, maximum capacity uh, upstairs in the sanctuary is 60 people. So that's what we're looking at for numbers of, of people who can who can come. So we have this opportunity of being outdoors, uh, distance as much as we want, and we're, we're under the prote protection of the pavilion. So uh, please come on out. Uh, we have it uh, reserved from 11 a.m. till 2 p.m. Uh, my kind of hope at the beginning of all this was if people all showed up at 11, we get to see uh, the maximum number of people and then those who need to leave would, would trail off in the next while and, and we all have to be gone by 2 o'clock anyway. So no agenda to it, just come and enjoy fellowship uh, with one another. That's the whole goal, that's the whole point, and I hope to see you there. Uh, I'll be there, my family will be there too. The Great Commission team is issuing a challenge to our church. And that challenge is, is simply to reflect on the story of Jesus from your own perspective. Uh, what are the truths about him and how have they impacted your life? And they've asked me to organize uh, a five-sermon series. We began last Sunday. This is week two of that. Uh, and they've pointed us to an online resource that helps you to step through uh, writing these ideas down, reflecting through. So watch in the Saturday email update that I send out. Watch for the link there uh, for the guidance for thinking about reflecting on and, and telling the story of Jesus from your perspective. And tune into the sermons. And then each Sunday also, one of the Great Commission team members uh, will be presenting on screen and just giving you uh, a little bit of their perspective on why this is an important project for our, our church to do and be part of. Uh, today we have Paul on screen and he's going to bring us that greeting from uh, the Great Commission team. This Tuesday, as uh, we've been announcing, is the next official board meeting. And 
I expect they will make some decisions on reopening and we probably would have an announcement right away after they meet. So uh, please stay tuned for what's happening next. Uh, we'll present to the board a plan of reopening and uh, uh, they'll make some decisions on that. So that's this Tuesday, uh, September 22nd, they meet in the evening. I think those are all the announcements I really need to make. Uh, look in the uh, Saturday email update for, for other things. And uh, now let's begin our worship time by praying the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hello! Hi! Happy Sunday! We're excited to be worshiping with you again today. We're going to be singing, Oh, Praise the Name, in the key of G. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled. what the Lord has done in me in the key of C.
Hi, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Clayton and I'm a member of the Great Commission team. As Carol Donaldson so ably explained last week, we, team members, are going to share our faith stories in the hopes that it inspires all of us to share the faith stories, our faith stories, when God gives us opportunities to do so. We come not as experts, but as people on a journey trying to discern what God is trying to teach us about how to witness for him. I think it's really important when telling a faith story that we keep two questions in mind. First, who is my audience? Who am I talking to and what is their faith story? And have I adapted what I'm going to say to that person that I'm talking to? The second question is, have I listened well to the person I'm sharing with before I speak? What I'm going to do now is give you a hypothetical conversation with an imaginary friend whom I will call John. Hopefully, what you will see in the coming weeks is each member of our team sharing their story in a variety of different ways. And hopefully, you will see that there is no one way to tell a story and there is no one right way for you to tell your story. Please pray for our team as we all pray for you. Blessings. So John, I want you to thank I want to thank you for sharing your faith story with me. I feel privileged that you would do so. Do you mind me sharing my faith story with you now? Okay. I think you'll see, John, that in some ways your faith story and my faith story are similar and in other ways quite different. You see, I too was raised in the church and attended Sunday school weekly, just like you. I also made a profession of faith, what we used to call asking Jesus into my heart when I was 10 years old. However, unlike you, I stayed in a relationship with Jesus through my teen years, then through university and beyond. Now, you mentioned, John, that you found the rules of Christianity confining. You said you liked to party, but Christians seem so boring. I find that kind of sad because Jesus had a reputation of being a party person who liked to hang out with the sinners. I agree religious people can be seriously no fun in wanting to impose their rules on everyone. However, the Jesus I try to follow is the one who told us to live life to the full without abusing ourselves or others. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, he came to give life, an abundant life. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying my faith journey was totally smooth or without problems. About 10 years ago, I went through a really bad time, losing my career and letting it affect my family relationships. I shared this in a talk I did at my church last summer. And it's online if you're interested. No, I don't think being a Christian makes us immune from trouble. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 25, that God sends the sun and the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous, which means God sends good times and bad times to everybody, including Christians. I don't want you to think I'm some holier-than-thou kind of guy who thinks I'm better than you or others. My family could tell you that I have a lot of flaws. However, being a Christian means I need to strive to be better because Christ was better for me. I think it's important for me as a Christ follower to be constantly trying to grow. Right now, I'm taking an online course offered by a Franciscan priest on how to be a better Christ follower. There's room for lots of improvement, let me tell you. I believe that Jesus died for you, me, and all of humanity so that we could have full and abundant lives. I don't want to live a second-rate life. and I don't think most people want to do so either. Wouldn't you agree, John? 
Maybe the next time we meet for coffee, you could ask me any questions you have or share more of your story. I'd be happy to hear more of what you have to say. See you soon. Take care, John. Hi, everybody. Hi, guys. I'm Pastor Holly here, and I am back again this week with Super Flash Sam. That's me. <laughs> you seem to have slowed down a little bit this week, Sam. Everything okay? Yep, I'm good, Holly. You're good. What every, happened? Every superhero needs a break. Oh, just taking a little break, are you? Yep. That's good, because I heard a few people that were a little concerned that maybe you were a little hyperactive last week. Nope, just solving crime. Okay, solving crime? Yeah. Any any good crimes we should know about? It's confidential, Holly. It's confidential, top secret information. Top secret. Well, you do take this superhero business seriously. Sure do. All right, well, Sam, I know you're super fast. Yep. But we talked a little bit about your muscles last week and how strong you are. I'm very strong. You're very strong. How strong are you, Sam? I'm as strong as Barry, remember? Right. And strong. James. And besides Barry and James, what, what feats of strength can you do? Um, I can just lift things. You can just lift things. Can you do any push-ups? Oh, yeah. Oh, can you do one for us right now? Yeah. Watch. All right, let's girls. see. Here we go. Are you ready? Whoa, that is so strong, yeah. Sam. Yeah. So you can do push-ups. How yeah. many push-ups can you do? Five. Five? Yeah. Whoa. I know. That I know. is impressive. Um, and you can lift things. Yeah. Wow, that is, that's pretty impressive. Well, I thought this morning, Sam. I can even lift things with my nose. You can lift things with your nose? Yes. Oh, very good. And it's called a talent. It is that you are so talented, Sam. I know. A man, a sock of so many talents. I know. We've just scratched the surface of how talented you are, haven't we? Yeah. Well, Sam, I thought we'd do a little test today to see how strong you are. That's a lot of chains, Holly. This is a lot of chains. And oh I gosh. thought we would put these on. And just on, him. on you. Are you crazy? I am not. And just see if you are strong enough to break out of these chains. Huh. I think you can do it. Yeah, I'm ready to give it a whirl. All right, well, let's let's put them on here. Ow, my eyeballs. Oh, okay. How about we just there yes. we come on? Okay, and let's for good measure, we don't want you All right. cheating. All right, Sam. Show us your strength! Bust out of those chains! What's the matter, uh, Sam? Uh, oh, come on, you can do it! Uh, Are they heavy, Sam? Uh, Are they heavy? Yeah! Oh, man. Well, you know what, Sam? I'm stuck! Oh. You know what? I'm thinking about Superman right now, and for him, kryptonite was what kind of got in the way of his strength. Well, chains tonight is doing it to me, Holly. They are, and you know what the chains are reminding me of? They're reminding me of sin. Oh. And how sin gets in the way of our relationship with God. And they can weigh us down. Yeah, like they're weighing me down. They are weighing you down. Well, what do you think? Get up. Sam, do you want to get free of those chains? Yeah, I want to break free. Okay, well, I think maybe you need a little bit of help. Let me help you here. Ready? One, two, break the chains, three. Holly. Oh. oh. That is so there weird. you go, Sam. Yeah, that was like the song. Set me free. Set me free. Set me free, Lord. Set me free. Set me free. Set me free. Set me free, Lord, set me free. <laughs> oh, that was... Do you remember that song? I don't. I've never heard that song Are before. Are you serious? I am serious. Well, then I was going to ask you to sing it with me, but forget it. You'll just, you'll just ruin it. I would not want to do that, Sam. No. But it does remind me. It's a good song that yeah. reminds us. That you break the chains and it sets you free. Exactly. God, Jesus, breaks the chains of sin. And... 
Because now I'm free. Now you're free. And you know what? Sin does it when God made us. He made us to be in a close friendship with him. And when Adam and Eve were in the garden, they walked in the garden every day with God. Because he then, walks with them and talks with them. And tells them I am his own. Yeah. And then they disobeyed and they sinned, didn't they? They did. And, and that one chain at a time just adds up. And as a result, we all sin. We all do things that are wrong. We have attitudes. You know what? It's not always just what we do or don't do. It's also sometimes our thoughts, our in attitudes that go against God too. And when we have sin in our life, it gets in the way of our relationship with God. But when we give that sin to him and we say, Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I want you to forgive me of the wrong things that I've done. Just like those heavy chains got, that were weighing you down came off, Sam. Yeah. Jesus takes that sin away and we are set free of those things that we've done. And you know what? It's then we are free to love God the way that he designed us to and to receive his love the way he wants us to. And we're free to love others and ourselves the way he wants us to. And we have so much freedom in Jesus. That's why we belong to the Free Methodist Church. We are free. <laughs> we are free from are a lot free of things. Are we? And Pastor Daniel, I think, is going to talk more about that today. And I am so thankful that for being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean having to follow a bunch of rules or things. But because I follow Jesus and have him in my life, I can live a life full of hope and freedom. And I can know God's love and peace in my life. Those are all things that we get. And you know what? As we talk about sharing the good news and our story with other people, we can tell them. That's what happens when we give our sin to Jesus. Yeah, that give it away. We are free to have his hope and his peace and his love in our lives. And so, boys and girls, I encourage you to keep sharing the good news with others. Tell them what's the difference in your life since you have chosen to follow Jesus. And if you haven't yet, I hope that you would talk to mom or dad or send me a message or Pastor Daniel, an adult that you know. Or me. Or Sam. Me. Sam, I'm sure, could help you answer your questions too. Yeah, I can because read them. Because Jesus wants to set us free of those sins, those wrong things that we've done. And we have all done things that are wrong, haven't we, Sam? Yeah, we have. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Even you, Pastor Holly. Even me. Just because you're a reverend. Light. Doesn't mean you're perfect. It does not mean I'm perfect, and it does not mean that I have never done anything wrong. And I'm thankful that Jesus forgives me too. Me too. Uh -huh. Even on a song. Yep. All right. Well, Sam, thank you again for always helping me share the good news with the boys and girls and the grown ups out there, and for all your help. And we hope everybody has a good day. Bye, guys. See you. <laughs> we'll be singing Waymaker in the key of D.
So I was on a teleconference call for some denominational meetings uh, last weekend. And our director of church development, uh, he was online and, and he made a comment. Um, this gentleman, he's especially tasked in our denomination with the goal of starting new churches. And his name is Jared. Well, Jared make a, made a comment last weekend that was pretty insightful. I thought he was talking about the difficulty of starting new churches in this period of COVID shutdown. And when you think about it, you can imagine how hard that would be to start a new church right now. To plant a new church, it requires what? What, what does planting a new church require? What do you think? Does it require a church building? No. Uh, you don't need that at the, at the planting stage. Does it require a pastor? No pastoring and planting a church are, are two different skill sets. To plant a church requires relationships. It requires relationships. Planting a church in Canada is almost like missionary work anymore. A missionary goes to a new faraway place. And how do they start planting a church? Well, they begin with a job where they can build some credibility in the community. Uh, teaching and, and medical are two of the most widely used uh, professions for this purpose. And then, while in that job and in that community and living there, they begin to build friendships with their colleagues and with their clients and with their students and with their neighbors. They volunteer at various community events and functions. They get to know people in a lot of ways. And it's in that relationship forming and in getting to know other people and making new friends, that's where the missionary then begins to tell the story of Jesus to these people they've now been introduced to. They tell the story of Jesus to them. And then as people become curious and interested, a community of believers begins to form. Maybe just a student at first. Maybe then a young married couple. And maybe then a few more people. And suddenly uh, you have enough for a Bible study group in a home. And a few more people and suddenly there are two Bible study nights at two different homes. And a few more people and suddenly the group is too, bi too big to fit in one uh, house meeting. And so a church begins to form because the story of Jesus is told and that only happens because these friendships are made and these relationships are built. Relationships lead to the telling of the Jesus story which leads to a church forming. But always what comes first? Always coming first is the relationships that are built. In church planting, but also at any other time that the church wants to tell the Jesus story. And so the question that Jared posed to our group in the teleconference call last weekend, the, the question he posed to us was this. In the past six months of COVID shutdown, how many new friendships have you made? How many new friendships have you made? How many new relationships are in your circle of friends? Uh, your circle of friends is likely today the exact same as it was 189 days ago. And that reality is the current challenge of the church. How do we possibly tell the Jesus story when we don't have new people to tell it to? And one of our options is this. Well, we can throw our hands up in despair, hang our heads low, and give up. But that doesn't seem to be the kind of thing the church is called to do from Scripture and from the Lord Jesus Christ who gave us the power of the Holy Spirit, does it? And so we are called to advance the kingdom of God and preach reconciliation and forgiveness of sins, make disciples, baptize and, and uh, teach and there is no caveat which says something like, do those things except if it's really too difficult and it's a little bit complicated and, and too hard for you. Then you don't have to do all those things. There's no caveat. There's no exceptions. In fact, you might even argue that 
the exceptional circumstance of these COVID-19 days may be just the kind of time the world needs to hear the hope that is embedded in the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and hear it the most. These might be the days when the world really needs to hear the message of Jesus. And so the Great Commission team of this Peterborough Free Methodist Church is asking you to take some time and reflect on your own relationship with God through Jesus Christ and come to a point where you can begin to talk about it to others. And so, this sermon series, and we're on week number two out of a five-week series, we're going to talk about some of the very important truths you will want to consider as you think of the story of Jesus and how He has impacted your own life. Last week, uh, we were reminded that it is indeed Jesus' story that we're telling. Um, and our part mostly is to leave ourselves out of it as we focus on Him, right? But we do tell it from our perspective. Today, we'll remind ourselves of a second truth. That Jesus' story is about freedom. Freedom. Well, if the Old Testament contains the Ten Commandments, and if there are 613 commandments in all, then how can we call that freedom? It feels more like constraint. It feels more like oppression. It feels more like a weight. It feels more heavy. Some might even call it a burden. But Jesus says, actually, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says that in Matthew 11.30. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 says that the laws of God identify sin and its consequences so that you can be free of them. You can avoid them. So that's the theological principle. But it's perhaps better illustrated in the story um, of an encounter that Jesus had with someone in the New Testament. It's the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. So I'm going to read this out of the book of John, chapter 8. So if you have your Bible with you, turn there. John, chapter 8. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. So we'll read this story of Jesus' encounter with this woman and, and the group <laughs> who was with her. And we're going to think about freedom. The freedom that Jesus provides, okay? Okay. So John chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Well, Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him, so that they might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus, he bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Then neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. The story of Jesus is about freedom. So how is this a story of freedom? In fact, is it not a story of oppression in a way? A woman threatened with death for doing something wrong? How is that free? How is that fair? Should this woman not be able to love whoever she wants to? 
Well, adultery is a serious offense taken seriously by God. When you remember in our theology and in Scripture, it says that when a man leaves his father and mother, he will be united to his wife, and the two will become what? One flesh, right? And then what God has joined together, let no one separate. Adultery, therefore, tramples on multiple covenants. The covenant that a man makes with his wife is trampled on. The covenant that the woman makes with the man is trampled on. The implied covenant that everyone else should leave this couple alone now as off limits because they're married to each other, that covenant is trampled on. And the covenant that all this is established under the witness of God is also violated. Deep and sacred and sacramental bonds are offended and injured when adultery happens. And because of that importance, the Old Testament punishment is severe for offenders. Uh, if you want to see the Old Testament reference, look in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 22 to 24. Uh, but I'm not going to read it here with younger viewers uh, listening in because it's rather disturbing. But you do need to know that the punishment is for both the male and the female offenders. And the implication is that both are complicit in the adultery, nobody was forced against their will. Uh, so that's implied here uh, with this woman in the story. And then such guilt, the Old Testament says, against such a sacred institution as marriage required the utmost of consequence. And so this woman was brought to Jesus. As a test case, what would he do? What would he say? What would his judgment be? How would he handle this adulteress when the law was clear and it required justice? What would Jesus do here? Justice is a funny thing, isn't it? When it is owed to us, we want it. But when justice is gunning for us because we've done something wrong, then suddenly we think we deserve mercy and should throw justice out the window. I'm sure this woman thought that mercy was a good idea right now when this crowd was around her in the face of this executionary mob. But the group still figured that justice is what was deserved. But then Jesus did something entirely unexpected, didn't he? In two ways here, Jesus enacted freedom instead of wrath. How? Well, first, Jesus gave the woman freedom from guilt and sin. Anyone who is without sin, you cast the first stone is how he challenged their thinking. You are calling for justice, but think about this. How many times have you broken God's law? If we really want to talk about justice, then be careful what you wish for because all of humanity will fall under God's wrath. Don't ask for justice too impulsively because there's a pretty good chance that your own sin deserves consequences of their own. It's the old reminder that uh, when you point your finger at someone else's guilt, uh, you got three other fingers pointing back at yourself, right? Remember that ratio. So then with that kind of challenge issued to them, to them uh, the religious leaders suddenly, what did they do? They dropped the subject and they walked away, didn't they? They did not condemn her any longer. Which then, ironically, left Jesus as the final accuser who did indeed fit the criteria of being without sin. Therefore, he did have the moral authority to throw the first stone, didn't he? But still he said to her, where are your accusers? Is there nobody left to condemn you? And if they are gone, then neither will I condemn you. 
so let's be clear. She's guilty. She's guilty of doing what they said she did. She deserved the Old Testament consequences. She had a crowd willing to pounce. But with a few words of truth and perspective, Jesus freed this woman. Freed her from the wrath of the crowd. Freed her from guilt. Freed her from sin. Freed her from condemnation. Freed her from transgression. She deserved all that as everyone who sins does deserve it. But Jesus is not interested in meeting out the heavy hand of the law. Jesus' desire is freedom. Her identity does not have to be defined and marred by this error, by this mistake, by this regret. I get so frustrated when people say that the church is all about rules. Are you kidding me? The church is all about rules? The stories we tell of Jesus are about people who are relieved of their guilt, no longer condemned to punishment. Because love covers a multitude of sins. And as Matthew 18, verse 18 says, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Meaning if you are willing to forgive a person, then God will follow your lead and forgive them too. The laws and rules of Scripture are not intended to spoil your fun. Rather, they're there to inform you. Kind of like a a traffic uh, sign that says, Bridge out ahead. And if that sign is there, you are still free to do whatever you want. You can make whatever choice you like. You can go full speed ahead if you really want to. But if you do, you're going to fall into danger. The choice is yours. The thrust of what Jesus tells us, the thrust of the stories of the Gospels, the thrust of the teaching of the New Testament is not that Christianity and the church are about rules. It's about freeing us from the consequences of sin. So what this story of the woman illustrates for us is the great compassion of God. That when we do stumble and when we do falter, even when we know better, God is willing to forgive past wrongs. The woman in the story was guilty of her offense. If she was not, the group uh, would have no cause to condemn her. This was not a trial as she was already convicted and found guilty. But where the world would break a person under the weight of guilt and condemnation, Jesus was willing to forgive. And His forgiveness is no pie in the sky empty gesture, right? Jesus has the authority to forgive. Why? Because He is the Son of God. And Jesus has the power to forgive sin because why? He Himself is innocent of breaking God's law. And Jesus has the means to forgive sin Why? Because He went to the cross. He has the authority and the power and the means to forgive sin. So because of who He is, He's able to free this woman. And He can free you too from your sin and your guilt. And that becomes part of your story, your experience with Jesus Christ. Part of your testimony. The story, the heart of the story is Jesus' forgiveness and freeing us from the wrongs we have committed and the burden that is lifted off your shoulders because there is now no condemnation for those who love Him. And so as you're organizing your story and as you reflect on it and even as you write it down, think about what is it that God, through His Son Jesus, what is it that He's forgiven in your life? Not that you need to air your dirty laundry in front of the whole world every time uh, you talk about Christ. (laughs) Indeed, in this age of social media, I sometimes cringe at the amount of oversharing uh, that happens often. Uh, Lots of times it seems like it's just a, a grab for sympathy. 
and attention. Sympathy being the negative cousin of empathy. But where it is appropriate, and in those conversations where a live example would help enhance and, and personalize and, and make the rubber meet the road in someone's heart as you try and explain to them the story of Jesus' forgiveness, then by all means, in those situations, tell the story of your own forgiven sin so that it brings understanding about the power of Jesus' forgiveness and the freedom that it can offer. So in Jesus, we are free from the condemnation of past sin. And we should tell that characteristic about Him and maybe even pepper in our own experience of forgiveness where appropriate. But there is a second freedom this woman has experienced. Look back at John chapter 8. Look at verse uh, 10 and 11. The, the last two verses, okay? Okay. So Jesus stood up and said to the woman, Well, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. One of the things I've noticed about this word, free, is that there are some things that we are free from and some things that we are free to. With this woman, she was free from the guilt and condemnation of sin because Jesus offered to her forgiveness. But now in the last eight words of our text, Jesus releases her to be free into something else. As He says, go and from now on, from now on, sin no more. You are free to that agenda. Free from guilt and free to sin no more. The leadership of our denomination has been thinking a lot about this recently. Uh, free is right in our name, isn't it? The Free Methodist Church in Canada. The word free is there for a uh, historical reason. Back in the year 1860, that's 160 years ago, a council headed up by a pastor named B.T. Roberts. Uh, in fact, he was a lawyer before he was a pastor. Well, he led a council that broke away from the Methodist Church in the United States. There were practices of the church that this council disagreed with and practices they thought were non-scriptural, practices they wanted to be free from, right? And so, uh, free meant freedom from slavery. Because back in that day and age and back in that uh, iteration of the Methodist church, uh, slavery was uh, not banned. Uh, free also meant freedom from class structure, where the wealthy would pay to sit in the privileged seats in the church building and, and anywhere else there were privileged seats in a building. They wanted freedom from that kind of uh, inequality of class. And free also meant freedom from uh, secret society so that no, no thing like a, a British gentleman's club, say, no organization like that could dominate the direction and leadership of the church from uh, backroom handshake deals that went on. Uh, these are all the kinds of things that this group was wanting to be free from, Right? But now, we recently have been playing around with that word and exploring how to communicate what we are free into because, our, because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so our denomination is, has played around with some wording and we've articulated six points of, 
of freedom. Uh, these words are still only an experimental stage of wording and, and we need to take them to the whole general conference for a vote in order to adopt them as official statements. Uh, but here's the wording of these six points. So the six frees. What are we free into? Well, we are free to follow God. We are all free to journey with God who invites and empowers us to join Him on His mission to reconcile everyone and everything. We are free to work alongside of Him and His agenda of kingdom building. Number two, we are free to hope. We are free to experience the deep peace of God, to live without fear or guilt, and to accept God's healing and restoration and transforming grace. And what a burden gets lifted off our hearts and our shoulders when we embrace that forgiveness. And we are free to collaborate. We are all free to work and pray and learn and partner with people, with churches and other organizations that are in harmony with our mission. And our mission is to see a healthy church within the reach of every Can Canadian uh, and beyond. We're free to be courageous. We are free to follow God's Spirit, learning, innovating, and exploring new territory for ministry in ways that make sense for our local context and mission. And so every church is permitted to know the community you live in, know your neighbors, know your uh, county, know your city, and minister to it in the best way uh, that you can think of that the Holy Spirit will uh, help you discern and lead you into. Uh, do that with creativity. Do that with passion. And do that with energy. Fifth, we are free to pursue justice. We are free to challenge racial and economic injustice. Champion equality. And advocate for the inherent rights and value of all people living out the legacy of our movement. Uh, the Free Methodist Church, the Methodist before them, uh, we have quite a phenomenal record in our history of our movement of um, looking at those around us who are oppressed and standing up for them. And the last one, number six, free to experience community. We are all free to enjoy gracious, authentic relationships with one another as the family of God while practicing the ways of Jesus. <laughs> that oneness, that, that church familyness, that togetherness, that unity in the Spirit because we are under one truth, one Lord, and one God who is Father of all. And that binds us together with cords of love that cannot be broken. We are free to all these things, right? So, so you kind of see how uh, the leadership in our denomination is, is wrestling with trying to articulate proactive uses of the word free here. Does no one condemn you? Then neither do I. You are free from all of that. But from now on, go and sin no more. You are free to pursue that so folks as you reflect on the story of Jesus from your own perspective consider using this concept of freedom consider and reflect on uh, how has Jesus freed you from sin and from condemnation and from guilt and then also what is he calling you to be free to do amen we're going to be saying when it's all been said and done
So today at 11 o'clock, I really hope to see you at Nichols Oval Pavilion, and uh, we'll have a wonderful time of fellowship there together. Uh, let us leave and depart with this word from Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 1 and 2. It says this, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Thank you for joining us online. God bless. Have a great week.